This is a lecture about ABA model rule 1.14 or 1.14. We're going to be talking about representing clients with diminished capacity. <clears throat> the client with a diminished with diminished capacity. Again, this is rule 1.14. Part A, when a client's capacity to make adequately considered decisions in connection with the representation is impaired, whether because of minority, and by that we mean they're a child or underage, um, a mental impairment or for some other reason, the lawyer shall, as far as reasonably possible, maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client. I'm going to stop right here. You know what our concern is? Our concern is that when you are representing a client who is um, uh, mentally impaired, they're not completely lucid, it's a child or something like that, it's very, very tempting for you as a lawyer to um, it, uh, leave them out of the loop and just make all the decisions yourself. And it takes too long to explain to thing, uh, things to them, um, and you're going to tell yourself it doesn't do any good. And as much as possible, you need to maintain a, a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client. Also, as you're going to see, we certainly want lawyers to be respectful and, and courteous to people who, um, it, it, who are marginalized by our society sometimes because of their um, impair impairments or cognitive decline or things like that. Now, B, when a lawyer reasonably believes that the client has diminished capacity, sorry about how cluttered this slide is, but this is all one sentence is at risk of substantial physical, financial, or other harm unless action is taken and cannot adequately act in the client's own interests, the lawyer may take reasonably necessary protective action, including consulting with individuals or entities that have the ability to take action to protect the client and, in appropriate cases, seeking the appointment of a guardian ad litem, a conservator, or a guardian. And so this is a drastic scenario. Um, this happened to me when I was a new attorney. Um, I had a client um, a, a, when I was a legal aid lawyer who had some pretty severe impairments and, it, and the representation became incredibly stressful. And, um, and that's when I went and looked at this rule and it, it didn't really tell me exactly what to do. It said that in some cases, um, if the client, is, there's a substantial risk of harm, right, or a risk of substantial physical harm, financial harm, the person is giving all their money away um, uh, to strangers or something like that, you can take protective action. And notice that this could mean talking to their family, um, talking to social workers, and your most drastic case is to go and talk to a court about it and try to get some sort of legal intervention um, it, uh, in the client's case to protect your client. C, when you're taking these, this type of protective action um, pursuant to paragraph B, the lawyer is impliedly authorized under rule 1.6A, that's our confidentiality rule, to reveal information about the client, but only to the extent reasonably necessary to protect the client's interests. And so the fact that you have a client with um, uh, a, a mental uh, impairment or it could be a mental disability um, or, or uh, is underage or something like that and you need to seek an intervention, you need a guardian, uh, them to have a guardian ad litem appointed or um, even a guardian, uh, someone who could make a decision to have them institutionalized or something like that, um, you're going to have to reveal some information um, uh, about that. Or it could also be something less drastic, like you're notifying the family, like you need to get involved, the, uh, this person shouldn't be living by himself or herself or something like that. Um, it doesn't give you an occasion to dish about your client, to, to, to basically um, uh, say, let me tell you some great stories or something like that. Um, about the person who you're still representing. In other words, you say you, you are authorized to make the disclosures to di divulge the information necessary to protect your client's interests, um, but it's not a, uh, don't, um, don't ink your book deal yet. We're going to go through just a few of the comments uh, related to this rule. 
um, that I think are helpful for students in answering test questions. By the way, I'll be surprised if you have a question about this rule on the MPRE, although it is fair game. So we have to cover it. By the way, I don't remember learning anything about this uh, rule when I took professional responsibility as a law student. And then um, my uh, about a year and a half into out of law school, I this kind of this became my life. And I wished I had um, had a little more instruction and uh, been prompted to think it through and so forth. The normal client lawyer relationship is based on the assumption that the client, when properly advised and assisted, is capable of making decisions about important matters. When the client is a minor or suffers from a diminished mental capacity, however, maintaining the ordinary client lawyer relationship will not be possible in all respects. So, in particular, a severely incapacitated person may have no power to make legally binding decisions, right? I mean, imagine you're representing someone who's in a coma right, or, or isn't lucid, doesn't even recognize anyone, um, then, then how can they make a legally binding decision? Nevertheless, a client with diminished capacity often has the ability to understand, deliberate upon, and reach conclusions about matters affecting the client's own well-being. And they're going to give you some examples, and these are really useful examples to understand what we're doing with this rule. For example, children as young as five or six years of age, and certainly those of 10 or 12, are regarded as having opinions that are entitled to wait in legal proceedings concerning their custody. And in some states, um, by the time they're 10 or 12, they, they, it's controlling wait. And, and in other jurisdictions, it, it's at least going to be, um, they're at least going to be asked, and it will be one of the factors considered. And so is that child... Um, uh, old enough to sign a legally binding contract? No, but um, we do take their opinion seriously about which parent they would want to live with. So also, there's our next paragraph, it is recognized that some persons of advanced age can be quite capable of handling routine financial matters while needing special legal protection concerning major transactions. And so when we think about some of our um, elderly uh, uh, um, members of our society and, and senior citizens, um, I can tell you, I have elderly relatives who can, uh, they can manage, the, they can go and get their prescriptions filled and, and, st and, and stop and get some groceries or um, and, and stop for a cup of coffee somewhere. And they, they kind of, they, they really cherish the independence that, that they still have, whatever that is, of being able to balance their checkbook or make pay for some of their, their own bills and, and live independently. On the other hand, we all know that um, the scams and con artists and so forth will often um, prey upon um, our senior citizens and our elderly and try to get them to make major financial commitments, buy a timeshare in um, Cancun or, or, or put another roof on their house when they just put one on last year and, and things like that, that, uh, that can be devastating. And so what the ABA rules is trying to recognize this. And I want to say something to um, my students. In our common parlance in our society and sometimes in our legal discourse, um, we have this unfortunate tendency to, um, uh, to categorize people as, uh, as either um, completely like lucid and sane and fully functioning cognitively, or they get dismissed as crazy um, and incompetent or feeble-minded or things like that. And that is, does not reflect reality. That does not reflect um, the, the consensus of the mental health profession right now and so forth. The fact is that there's a lot of people who have some impairments or some limitations are actually otherwise able to function as adults in our society. And I, I, I cringe sometimes even when I hear lawyers or other academics uh, talk about, um, well, we just need to do this with all the crazy people or, or something like that. And that's not a medical term. And if you find yourself thinking of your client that way as a lawyer, like my client's just crazy, um, then you have a problem. And you, you need to hit the pause button and step back and say, look, my client has a problem with this. My client has some limitations. My client um, struggles with this. And on the other hand, my client's able to do this. My client can carry on a conversation. My client has thoughts and feelings and values their independence. And that's important. 
And that is what they deserve from you as their advocate. Comment two, the fact that a client suffers a disability does not diminish the lawyer's obligation to treat the client with attention and respect. Even if the person has a legal representative, the lawyer should, as far as possible, accord the represented person the status of a client, uh, um, of client particularly in maintaining communication. Um, I can tell you, when people start to um, suffer from uh, different types of mental impairments, and this could be um, an older person who's starting to have some senior dementia or forget things, this could be a younger individual who's clinically depressed, or has had a brain injury or something like that. And sometimes they get, can, they feel confused or forgetful or have trouble focusing, whatever it is. Um, it, it, when, when you're in that situation, you start to feel like the people around you, the people in your life are starting to make decisions about you and without you being in the loop. And that's a terrifying and helpless feeling. Um, when you feel like you're being kept out of the loop about what's going to happen to you and what you're going to get to do or not do. And when your friends, your family members, or um, the people taking, helping take care of you or look after you and, and, and things like that are having these uh, conversations um, while you're not in the room. And that's very, very difficult. It's hard if you haven't experienced that or had someone you love experience that. It's, it's a little, you, it's hard to empathize. But it's very, and it, it, it's even worse when it's your lawyer who is making decisions, having conversations with people, and you're not in the loop. You don't really, you feel like you don't know what's going on. That's, um, uh, so that is what we're going to talk about um, with uh, Rule 1.4. I would really encourage you, uh, my students, to read through all of the comments but to be honest, a lot of them are very repetitive of the, the rules themselves. So there's a whole series of comments about the circumstances, how to go about um, seeking intervention um, on behalf of your client, getting someone appointed and things like that. But uh, I think you've gotten the point from the rule and, um, and uh, you should be able to know enough from the reading the rule and the first few comments that we talked about to answer test questions. Again, preparing yourself for practice, you owe it to yourself at some point to sit down and read slowly through all the comments to this rule and really give it some thought. 